So I uh, almost went bankrupt, lost it all, got to keep the house and cars and my wife <laughs> and my kids, and that's about it. And uh, so everything went up in flames. Meet Victor Nikolai, the founder of Luxate Digital Marketing. His business in the 2010s unfortunately went bust, but he rebounded and started a digital marketing agency that purely focuses on dentists. And he's built it into an $800,000 annual recurring revenue business with 30 happy clients. And in this episode, he's gonna share the lessons that he's learned from his past failures, as well as why customer service is the central point and pillar of everything that he does. Let's check it out. All right, Victor, good to talk to you. Welcome. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about how you got into the agency game. Uh, by accident, really. So um, I service the, uh, the dental vertical almost exclusively. Uh, and my dad is a dentist well, ever since I was, well, since I was born. And uh, it all sort of happened by fluke. I had actually come off the back of a previous business failure, uh, like catastrophic business failure in a completely unrelated industry whatsoever. I was actually running a uh, like a residential painting and renovation company, and uh, it was uh, it was really bad. So I uh, almost went bankrupt, lost it all, got to keep the house and cars and my wife <laughs> and my kids, and that's about it. And uh, so everything went up in flames. And so uh, my wife had an opportunity to uh, to go to work and be the breadwinner for the family. And so I stayed home with the kids. So while staying home with the kids, uh, while I love my children. Uh, it was not exactly intellectually stimulating. So I was just kind of looking for stuff to do. And my dad, uh, is, uh, he was on, the, he's on the, the back nine of his career and uh, hadn't had control of a lot of different aspects of his online presence, didn't have a Google business, didn't have a website, all these sorts of things that are just kind of fundamental. And so uh, I just started injecting myself into different areas of their business to see if I could just help for free. Cause I'm like, hey, I'm bored. Can I just like help you with that? And they're like, okay, fine, sure, whatever. And uh, just for free and just trying to contribute to uh, thinking about my dad being able to retire eventually one day and just trying to trying to help. So uh, after that, some of his colleagues kind of took notice. Um, my wife uh, was actually the manager of a, a large pediatric dental clinic as well. So, uh, so then they needed some things and I was like, oh, maybe like maybe I could help them. And so I pro we approached them. And uh, before you know it, we kind of started growing a roster of clients and I uh, realized that this was this is this could be a real business, not just something, you know, little. And uh, so I incorporated in 2019 uh, after helping my mom and dad for probably, my mom was the manager of my dad's clinic as well. So very family-based business. Uh, and I really just wanted to see them succeed and have, uh, yeah, just good, good business practices in general, so. Okay, I wanna to come to the previous business failure and yeah. what you've learned, because that yeah, sounds, yeah. That sound, that's, that's one of the best things in life, right? Learning from yeah, your, from yeah. your past yeah. mistakes. Uh, okay, but where's, where's Luxate at? Tell us the metrics, revenue, clients, um, yep. so, margins. Yeah, so currently we have uh, 30 clients. Uh, so we're not, we're not a, a large agency to any degree, um, but uh, we should do about 800 this year or so, 800,000. So uh, they're relatively high spend clients, generally speaking, and um, all in the dental industry. We think we have like an 86% retention rate or something like that. Um, so yeah, we try and just uh, provide as much, do as much good as we can, as long as we can. 800,000 and how many, how many employees? Uh, so myself, one full-time employee. Uh, and uh, then we have another part-time employee sort of coming on now as well. And then, um, uh, yeah, we delegate through third parties for certain things, depending on uh, what needs to get done for that particular client. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, why, why are you focusing just on the dental mm. uh, niche? Of course, you know, your family has a background on it. Your wife has a background on it, but, yeah. but, but why stay in just in dental? Um, it is uh, a really good quality client. Uh, the retention rates, I don't think it's because like we're so great. I think it's because uh, the clients, uh, that's just sort of how they operate. Uh, so we're, if we can get in, we're usually able to stick around for a long time, which is really great. Um, it was also a very underserviced uh, niche. So uh, there were a few kind of big players, but a lot of them were uh, sort of agencies based out of California who just like thousands of employees, you know, company wide. And so there's just a number to them and they have these templated websites that are just atrocious and um, they're also based in the states and so in dentistry in particular there are different regulations in different areas particularly in Canada and then also even interprovincial there's uh, variance amongst uh, that so being able to save conversations that they would have to have multiple times with agencies that are based out of the states or not dental specific just kind of put us up ahead in the 
uh, runnings when considering who to hire. You know, agencies, uh, other agency owners talk a lot about niching down. Mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you get a vertical right? Like if, if there's other agencies watching and they're strong in certain verticals or yeah. sectors of the market, how would you say uh, you need to get your sales process and your knowledge yeah. right around that? Um, I would say understanding their like pain points. So if you know what frustrates them already and you can have a solution just like lined up and ready to go, that's super helpful because then they already feel like you understand more about them than uh, somebody else. And uh, you position yourself as an expert in that field and like they'll come to you for, for uh, uh, answers to their questions because you give the impression that you're knowledgeable. So. Okay, so it started with your family's yep. uh, business and yep. then it went on. What, what, what was the key point where things gained momentum, mm. one dental practice after the other? Um, actually, probably COVID really helped, oddly enough. Um, I think we only had, I think we had about four clients at the time or something like that. And I was like, hey, this is great. Like this is, uh, and then uh, everything sort of shut down. And um, when things started to kind of open back up, so there's that kind of brief period where everyone was off doing nothing, twiddling their thumbs. And a lot of these business owners uh, had a chance to look at their businesses and see some flaws and gaps and then start Googling or asking around or whatever. And then uh, we'd pop up, whether in conversation amongst their peers uh, or, um, or, or like through search uh, criteria, and uh, I think we, I think we finished that that year with ten or something like that from four. And that doesn't sound like much, but like for me, just being a one man show for the most part, uh, it was overwhelming to like have that much growth all of a sudden in uh, or maybe it was twelve. I don't know, it, but for me, it was a lot, and I put a lot of energy and effort on a personal level into each of those clients, so it was taxing but great. And then there, from there, then, all, then they would speak. Uh, dentistry is a very incestuous community. So everyone knows everyone. They all talk. And uh, if, you're, if you're doing good stuff, they hear about it. If you're doing bad stuff, they hear about it. And so within those little kind of communities, uh, if you establish a good name, then uh, yeah, it just sort of snowballs. So your acquisition process was really around um, uh, getting these referrals, yeah. or starting with a family business, getting these referrals, and then you focus so much uh, in this space that it just built itself from, from there. Yeah, yeah. So, so th is, there, is there like a, a sales pipeline, a cold email campaign, uh, uh, cold calls, anything like that that needs to be uh, We did a lot, I did, well, I did a lot of uh, events. So like there are some dental events uh, that get put on by other vendors. And if you can kind of schmooze your way into getting invited to those and then make some impressions and, and uh, I got asked to speak at a few uh, dental events on marketing in particular. And so just further positions yourself as being a subject matter expert. And uh, so, yeah. Okay, so main lead generation tactic, get invited to parties yeah, in yeah. that niche. Learn how to drink really well. Okay, <laughs> learn to drink and yeah, so get you can invited remember, to parties. So remember people's names while you're drinking. <laughs> Teeth have to be white too. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Invest in whitening because you're going to be drinking a lot of wine, so... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then can you tell us about how you manage to close these deals? Talking to them is one thing. Mm -hmm. What what do you what do you show them, tell them uh, in order to win the business? Hmm. Uh, well, first thing is we show them their gaps. Like they obviously typically approach us. So um, they already know they have a problem. They either know they have a problem or they're beginning a, a new clinic. And so they're approaching you because they need to build everything. Um, so if they know they have a problem, uh, having some tools to be able to show them like exactly the full extent of their problems and then to go like, oh boy, like we really got to dig in. And then like, what do you know? I have solutions for all those different problems uh, that usually lends itself to. And then also too, like we're very uh, boutique. So being able to customize and tweak our packages and bundles to like to specifically service that client's problems is very helpful. And what do you sell a typical dental practice? Like what, what does a package look like? Um, typically we do uh, website build and uh, hosting maintenance, et cetera. Uh, we do social media management, uh, we do ad campaign, SEO, um, uh, a few little kind of fluff things here there. We do a little bit of uh, video content as well for, for socials, um, not a whole ton because it's costly, <laughs> but uh, for certain uh, clients that's the right thing. But that's the, the standard package typically. Sounds like a lot you're doing your, yourself uh, mm -hmm. and as you've grown, I think you mentioned you brought on an employee, you brought on a part-time employee. Maybe walk us through your operations. Who, who does what? What do the humans do? What do the VAs do? What, yep. do, what does technology do to, to help those dental clinics uh, thrive? 
Yeah, so we have uh, I have a, a, a kind of a web a web team that builds uh, builds the sites. Um, the web team was me for a long time, <laughs> so I was building the sites. Uh, but it's extremely time consuming, so uh, I found a way to hire someone on to kind of take care of that. Uh, social media as well, so that uh, was also me for a long time building all that out, uh, and now we have. Uh, team members doing that. Um, and then it's kind of task delegation. We also have a few like subcontractors that we work with. So uh, videographers, photographers, that sort of thing that aren't necessarily on the payroll, uh, but they but they, they pretty much work for us most of the time. Um, so yeah, just figuring it all out, I guess. So would you say, you know, you're at $800,000 of, of revenue and you really care about these clients. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, there comes a time where you kind of need to step back as a CEO yeah. and start uh, outsourcing this stuff like yeah. wh wh when is that time now basically i'm at that point where like i feel a massive bottleneck and i just uh i uh I, i'm overwhelmed by the the different directions that i i spend myself finding far too much time working in the business when i should be working on the business and so uh carving out and delegating tasks in order to be able to focus on scalability is really what I'm doing now. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. what do you, what do you focus focus on now if other people are doing th the things that need the, the like like you're saying if it was perfectly everything was delegated the way like what would I be focusing on? Yeah. Mm, good question. Uh, well, for starters a bit of a break. <laughs> I'm just going to probably just take like a couple of weeks not like off but just uh ease my mind a little bit um, and then uh, have a few projects uh, to be able to provide more value. Uh, kind of in the AI field that I'm planning on bringing on for uh, for clients. So I want to focus a bit on that. Um, and then I would like to focus on uh, business development because truthfully, uh, aside from the kind of initial networking and glad handing that I, that I did, I haven't done a lot of um, active pursuit of new business. So it would be developing sales structures and um, our own ad campaigns to kind of do outreach because we also uh, we're located in Edmonton, and it's roughly a million people or so, but we're sort of at the like ethical saturation point where I feel like not great about taking on too many more clients because they're too close to our other clients, and then I feel like I'm just competing with myself to a large degree. Um, so we're trying to expand to other uh, cities, basically. Um, so a pursuit into other uh, geos would be the next move. What excites you about, you mentioned an AI project, what, what excites you about uh, AI and, and how are you using it already, both on your operations and to get things done for clients quicker? Uh, yeah, well, getting things done for client, clients quicker is one thing for sure, because uh, it takes a lot less time to create. Um, a lot of times it, it, it seems like it's creating a lot better quality now, so we use it for some, some social marketing uh, posts, uh, for some uh, replying to client reviews uh, to a degree, um, and then we also have some cool things we're working on as far as um, uh, communicating with a dental clinic, uh, like from a potential patient to a dental clinic or an existing patient to a dental clinic where um, they'd be able to book an appointment through AI directly into the system uh, sort of thing in a very conversational sort of way. Okay. Now, Vic, you mentioned you, you cared a lot about your clients, and it sounds like you've had a slow and steady approach to this. You yeah. perhaps could have had a lot more business if you didn't care about the service so mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. what, what, what is it about the service? What, uh, how do you make it special? Why is it so important uh, mm. to, not, to not compromise on that? Um, well, I can't curse, can I? I we're we're in Canada. We can, bleep, can we bleep it out? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give, I'll give, I'll give it the, the PG version. So, uh, because my dad uh, is a dentist, and because the community is so incestuous, uh, my dad, uh, when he realized that, like, okay, like he's going to make a business out of this, uh, he sat me down and looked me in the eye, and he said, "If you ruin the last name that I spent 40 years building, I will kill you." <laughs> and he didn't look away, and he didn't stutter, and uh, and uh, and he meant it. So. Um, Legacy and reputation is all very important to me. And so, um, yeah, staying power is really important to me and integrity is really important to me. So uh, I won't compromise either of those things. When you're dealing with clients, when you bring on a team to deal with clients, can you walk us through like the principles of good client success, uh, of, mm. of client success and, and client serviceability? Uh, probably a, a lot of it is... Uh, Listen in when you think you should be talking. <laughs> so, so paying attention to what they're telling you. How do you ensure um, that the products, the service, are tailored for clients in a bespoke way? Mm, that's a really good question. I think probably we have a, we have a lot of communication with our clients where I think um, 
maybe others don't. Uh, we do a lot of like face-to-face -face interaction. We do a lot of like phone call interaction. And so there's maybe less form fills. There's less data gathering from uh, you know onboarding documents. And it's more like conversational and kind of getting a uh, like a vibe or a sense from a client. And then sort of making sure we have people on the team that we can kind of who also communicate in vibe. And so then we can express what the vibe that we're going for is and then have that come across creatively, I would say probably is, um, it's, it's less like nuts and bolts and more like feel. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, go back to the beginning where you mentioned your catastrophic yeah. business failure. Sure, yeah, okay, yeah. So just remind us, what was the business again? Yeah. Um, what did you What did you learn from from, yeah. from, from it? From How did it I going crash and burn? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it was a uh, painting and renovation company of all things, um, and we ran for three years and had like a, a good deal of success. And then we had uh, a string of several months of a uh, combination of poor uh, decision making, uh, poor clients, poor staff. Uh, and uh, it's amazing how big of, a, big of a hole you can dig in just a few months of, uh, of mistakes. So we had 12 staff at the time. And I think my, my big mistake there was uh, I just grew way too fast. I delegated way too much too soon um, because I was trying to be a businessman and I wanted to you know, make it big and you know, have this big team and feel like I was an entrepreneur. And uh, it was too much too quick and I should have uh, not done that. Okay, so if we wrap this up, you got the lessons. Yeah, you started an agency. Yeah, other agencies are looking to you for inspiration. What would you What would you say are like the key mm. things they should know in order to not have that experience not, you had in the crash past and, burn. and yeah. have and have have the success you you have now? You know, you've got you've carved out such a name in a in an incestuous name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say uh, having a genuine sense of like caring. If you don't care, you won't. Uh, you won't put in a whole lot of effort. I think a lot of people always think you really need to like love what you do. Um, but the reality is I don't think you're always going to love what you do. But if you care, whether it's uh, like you care because you want to help or you care because you're afraid of consequences of like of not doing a good job or something like that, uh, you're going to make sure you do your most to, to, to do your best in that set of circumstances. So I would say, uh, yeah, have a, ha genuinely care. And if you don't, then, then don't even bother. All right, so Vic, uh, tell us about ultimate client red flags and yeah. how you deal with them. Uh, yeah, so I don't know if I can really define when I feel the red flag, but there's just little, you kind of get those like pangs, those little like, oh, I don't like that. And then like there'll be another one, you're like, if it makes you just kind of cringe a bit, pay, like pay attention. Uh, every time that I've not listened to my gut, it has backfired like every single time. And so there are certain clients where like I didn't listen to my gut and I, and I, I did get into contract with them uh, and then eventually make the choice to like to fire that client because it's not, not worth the hassle. Okay, so what, what, what would the uh, indicators be for people uh, listening? Uh, is it uh, scope creep? Is it uh, uh, asking for too much, paying too little? Yeah, uh, well, I think it prob probably all of those things to, to a degree. Uh, but a huge part of it is just like feel like maybe I'm just like too, too much of a feely person. But, uh, if you are, uh, asking too much, uh, in, 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 like in a, in a condescending sort of, sort of way, uh, like respect is really big for me. So if like, if you're going to start being disrespectful, like we're just not gonna, it's not gonna work out. Um, so I would say a lot of it's just kind of intangible and I, I don't really know how to like communicate that, but otherwise, uh, there's a vibe. There's a vibe. There's a vibe. Yeah, you can yeah, just like vibing. tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, you know, someone you'll say, uh, I've had clients like text me on Father's Day on Sunday and be and be like, hey, can this, 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 and so uh, you know, then I it makes me mad when I get that text. I'm like, I don't need to be thinking about this on Father's Day. And then so then I text them on Monday and I say like, hey, I'm so sorry, like sorry to get back to you, but like it was Father's Day and I was whatever. And then they're like, oh yeah, sorry, like so sorry about that. Didn't even think about that. And then uh, <laughs> and then. You know, then there's another, like, and it's another Sunday, and then they text you again at, like, 7 o'clock on a Sunday. And it's like, hey, well, you didn't listen to, like, let's have some boundaries here. I, I don't, you're not entitled to my free time. You're not entitled to my, all my, my whole life. Um, so if you can't respect that, then, like, probably better that we, we, we're not a good fit. You should probably find some, someone else to take care of stuff for you. Curious about negotiating tactics. You, you work with quite a wealthy niche. Yeah. Um, You've got clients established, and you know there's certain rates they 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 play. Uh, yeah. They pay, um, assuming they're quite generous. Um, how do you make sure that um, clients are 
paying the money that they can and that you deserve? Absolute transparency, for starters. Um, dentists in particular are used to people approaching them and knowing that they probably have some money and then gouging or taking advantage. So if you come across as genuine, uh, where you're like, we're going to do this and this and this, and like, this is what we charge, um, they really appreciate that authenticity where you're not like used car salesmaning them, yeah. you know? Uh, so I have a very uh, like lax sales approach, like as low pressure as you can get. Um, because when you force it, again, it's just, uh, it's not a good way to start a relationship. So I'd much rather have everyone want to be there and then there's so much less tension. And for transparency, do you have standard pricing across the packages? Yeah, for the most part, yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously things scale up if they want specific unique things or uh, if they're in an area where uh, like that ad spend just is not going to work where you're trying to get patients. So, um, but yeah, it's fair, fairly standard across the board. Um, I found that every time that I've given a discount, it has uh, backfired. Why? I, well, the, it seems like the people who pay the least want the most. And if they're looking for a deal, I want people who see value in what we do uh, rather than try and devalue that service. So like when someone asks for a discount, I say, actually, we don't do discounts. Rather than devalue our service, I'd rather give you something for free. So uh, that's my kind of way of countering, uh, yeah, if they, if they are looking to feel like they're getting it up, uh, I don't want to diminish what we're doing because like this is what it's worth. Um, so let's not tarnish that. But like here's a little freebie, a little gift. So don't discount, give them a cherry on top though. Totally, yeah, good way to put it, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Vic, thank you so much. You're welcome.